I consider myself a very lucky person. Everything in my life goes well and I've got very little to complain about. Yet anyone's luck will pale in comparison to the luck we are going to squeeze out of today's character builds. Welcome to the Attic Dungeon. My name is Sam and I'm here to help you with everything. I could start this episode with a very bad, dirty Harry reference, but let's not do that. Instead, we're going to have a look at the Lucky Bastard builds. Yes, builds. I'll be presenting you two builds that emphasize on bending the luck of the dice to your will as much as you can. Apart from the builds, I'll also zoom in on some RP advice for these, because using luck as a mechanic is one thing, but creating an entire character concept around it is something else. A uh, small side note, while I do strive to make all of my builds as efficient as possible, I don't consider these min-maxing builds. I will regularly make thematic choices over strategic ones because they fit the idea behind the build better. Both builds share the same race and some feats, so we'll have a look at those before we talk about each build separately. As for race, there is only one race that has luck running through its veins, and that is the halfling. These short, lovable creatures are lucky without even putting in any effort, thanks to their lucky racial. When you roll a 1 on the d20 for an attack roll, ability check or saving throw, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll. Our first dice bending tool. Even if this one only has a 5% chance per roll to come up, it's very nice to have. Since there is no limit to how many times per round this can be used, characters with extra attacks or spells like uh, Scorching Ray that make multiple attack rolls can benefit from this racial all day long. There's also no limit to the amount of dice it can affect in one roll, so if you're rolling with disadvantage or advantage and double ones come up, you can re-roll both of these numbers. I almost forgot, but as for subrays, we will be taking the stout halfling for two reasons. Uh, one, the plus one on constitution is going to give the two classes that we pick the most benefit, and two, he comes with an extra advantage to poison. Halflings already have an advantage against uh, being frightened, so having both of these gives us a bit more dice to roll, even if it is only on specific occasions. Let's have a look at the feats then. Not all of these feats will be featured in both builds, but they are all luck related and you could squeeze them into both builds if you really wanted to. Let's start with Captain Obvious feat for both builds lucky. Not to be confused with the above racial trait that has the same name, which is why I'll be referring to this one as Lucky and the other one as Halfling Luck from now on, just to keep the confusion at bay. You have inexplicable luck that seems to kick in at just the right moment. You have three luck points. Whenever you make an attack roll, an ability check or a saving throw, you can spend one luck point to roll an additional d20. You can choose to spend one of your luck points after you roll the die, but before the outcome is determined. You choose which of the d20s is used for the attack roll, ability check or saving throw. You can also spend one luck point when an attack roll is made against you. You roll a d20 and then you choose whether the attack uses the attacker's roll or yours. If more than one creature spends a luck point to influence the outcome of a roll, the points cancel each other out. No additional dice are rolled. You regain your expended luck points when you finish a long rest. In short, that means that on any attack roll, saving throw or ability check, you can roll an extra d20 if you want to. You can pick which of the two rolls you pick, but you have to do this before the DM tells you uh, the result of the first roll. Same goes for when you're attacked, the attacker rolls a roll and then you can decide to roll a luck die and you pick which of the two counts. Three luck points per long rest might not sound like a lot, but if used at the right moment, these can make you hit the jackpot in any social encounter or turn the tables in any battle. By the way, your halfling is now double lucky. Halfling luck and normal luck stack. What this means is that Halfling Luck allows you to re-roll any ones that come up on your lucky dice. And the other way around, if you've already re-rolled something with Halfling Luck and the re-roll is still bad, you can still add a lucky die. Again, even re-rolling this one if it should pop up on a one as well. 
it becomes even wackier when we go to advantage and disadvantage. Now for advantage, it is pretty straightforward. You roll with advantage. If you don't like the numbers, add a luck die and pick the highest number. But with disadvantage, you get to pick whatever die you want. You are no longer obliged to pick the lowest number. You have basically turned your disadvantage into super advantage. Enjoy! Important side note though, uh, rogues, this still counts as a roll with disadvantage, so no sneak attacking for you little buggers. But a halfling's luck doesn't stop there. Because of our race choice, there are two more racial luck-related feats available to us. Second chance and bountiful luck. We'll have a look at bountiful luck first. Your people have extraordinary luck, which you have learned to mystically lend to your companions when you see them falter. You're not sure how you do it, you just wish it, and it happens, surely a sign of fortune's favour. When an ally you can see within 30 feet of you rolls a 1 on the d20 for an attack roll, an ability check or a saving throw, you can use your reaction to let that ally re-roll the die. The ally must use the new roll. When you use this ability, you can't use your lucky racial trait before the end of your next turn. A feat for true team players! We are now using our luck to manipulate an ally's bad luck, sacrificing our own reaction and the use of our racial for one turn to save their ass as long as they're not too far away. If you play a class that does not have a lot of options when it comes to reactions and you don't roll a million attacks a turn, this feat is perfect for you. All those multi-attacking, two-handed, wielding fighters are going to be so very grateful for your assistance. Mind you, this feat only allows the player to re-roll one die, so no re-rolling double ones on advantage or disadvantage. The other halfling racial luck-based feat is called Second Chance. Fortune favors you when someone tries to strike you. You gain the following benefits. Increase your dexterity, constitution or charisma score by 1 to a maximum of 20. When a creature you can see hits you with an attack roll, you can use your reaction to force that creature to reroll. Once you use this ability, you can't use it again until you roll initiative at the start of combat or until you finish a short or a long rest. A more self-centered form of using luck. This time we use it to make a creature that attacks us Reroll. You can basically use it once per fight and it's a great thing to have when that big ass dragon comes clawing your face with a critical hit. The bigger your armor class, the better this feat becomes of course because the chances are higher that the reroll will just miss you and your shiny shiny armor. Uh, this feat also comes with an increase to con, dex or charisma. Oddly enough, no wisdom, so ghostwise halflings, you cannot pick up any extra wisdom. Maybe if you ask your DM nicely, he will allow you to pick it up, though it's not a game-breaking homebrew thing. Since both of these feats use your reaction, they don't stack super well, but it is technically doable to pick them all up on one character and become this awesome god of luck. Uh, speaking of awesome gods of luck, let's have a look at the full builds, classes, feats, races and everything! Finally, we get to the full builds, classes included. In today's episode, we will show you two builds. Uh, one is going to be a wizard, the other one is going to be a fighter. We'll take both builds to level 12, seeing as a lot of uh, basic D&D campaigns tend to cap out in that area of the leveling scale. Very few indeed go all the way, so it makes little sense for me to build some level 20 god of divine fortune if you never get to play it. So without further ado, let's have a look at our wizard. At level 1, our wizard is going to leave nothing to the imagination when it comes to his ability scores because of the fact that our halfling is not going to start with a very high intelligence. I chose to shore up his defenses. I put 15 in each a dex, con and int, giving us 17 dex, 16 con and 15 int to start with uh, once we add racial bonuses. We're not looking to be flexible in our skills, we just have to be lucky. Uh, Cantrip-wise, it would be awesome if your DM would allow you to use Unearthed Arcana's Mind Sliver. It's a lower damage cantrip that deducts 1d4 of the target's next saving throw before the end of your next turn if they fail an intelligence save. 
deal psychic damage which is always nice but more importantly we are manipulating dice rolls again if your dm does not allow you to pick up mind sliver i would advise you pick up frostbite frostbite is again a lower damage cantrip uh, this time a d6 frost damage but if the target fails a constitution save their next weapon attack has disadvantage it's less powerful than mind sliver in my opinion because a lot of humanoids tend to have multi-attack and you're only imposing the advantage on the first roll but it's still a way to influence dice rolls so that's why we're picking it up be sure to pick up light as well we have no dark vision and being blind is not good for level 1 spells, a thing could be set for picking up Magic Missile. We don't have the maximum intelligence score at level 1, so Magic Missile is an easy way to make sure that you can contribute some damage now and then. I would suggest to pick up Mage Armor over Shield because we are going to have a very high Dexterity score eventually and the extra armor will surely benefit you. Crowd control wise, I would say color spray. Color spray requires no saving throw. So again, at lower levels when we only have a plus two on our intelligence modifier, you will still be sure to impose some disadvantage on creatures around you. If you are allowed to pick up Mind Sliver, be sure to pick up Tasha's hideous laughter, seeing as you can muck up people's saving throw and then make them giggle until they die. That should be enough to get you started at level one. I'll highlight some things you get at higher levels. I'm not going to delve into which spells you should pick at each level. Be creative. Look for ways to fiddle with dice or fiddle with advantage, disadvantage, whatever. Do pick up some divination spells though, since level 6 uh, grants us an ability that allows us to recover spell slots when we cast divination magic, which is quite important. Level 2, of course, will lead us to the school of divination because we will need its signature ability, portent to be a master of dice. Starting at second level, when you choose this school, glimpses of the future begin to press in on your awareness. When you finish a long rest, roll 2d20s and record the numbers rolled. You can replace any attack roll, saving throw or ability check made by you or a creature that you can see with one of these foretelling rolls. You must choose to do so before the roll and you can replace a roll in this way only once per turn. Each foretelling can be used only once. When you finish a long rest, you lose any unused foretelling rolls. So now you can rig two extremely important rolls per day before they even happen. Lower rolls that you store can be used to make enemies miss with spells or have them completely fill their saves. Higher rolls are of course used to boost your own chances of success. If you roll a crit, give it to your rogue and watch him be oh so happy when he can roll his sneak attack damage twice. If you manage to take this build all the way up to level 14, you will gain an additional use of portent, bringing it up to 3 happy times. Level 4 brings us our first ability score increase. If you feel like the 15 intelligence is dragging you down too much, put one point in int and put the other one in dex to round that up to 18, which is going to improve your defenses and your initiative. If you have the guts to sit this one out, however, until level 8, pick up Lucky at level 4 already and start manipulating your dice. At level 8, you'll pick up whatever you didn't pick up at level 4. At level 10, we gain Third Eye. The ability might seem a bit gimmicky and trivial at first, but remember that almost all of our luck abilities are based on actually being able to see something. So having Dark Vision, which will be the standard choice, ethereal vision or the ability to see invisible creatures could be very vital at some point so pick your correct option at the start of the day if you know what is coming at level 12 this wizard will pick up bountiful luck it is time to start helping our allies fail less at everything this still leaves you with enough ability score increases to max out intelligence should you desire so or you could pick up second chance to go for the full luck build. So this build has a bit of a slow start when it comes to ability scores, but with the right spell choices, this wizard will be a master manipulator of everything dice related. This doesn't mean that you should be afraid to blow up something now and then. Don't hesitate to pick up lightning bolt or fireball at level 5. You're a wizard, have your fun. Let's have a look at our fighter build then. Why did I pick the fighter? Two reasons. 
Halfling luck becomes more and more valuable the more d20s you roll and nobody rolls as many d20s as that fighter who just blew his action surge and wants to beat the boss to a pulp. Second reason, the fighter gets two extra options for ability score increases or feats, so this allows us to really balance out our stats as well as picking up all the necessary feats to be a lock monster at relatively low level. Because we're a halfling, we will be making a dexterity fighter, of course, so we'll start by putting a 15 in both dexterity and constitution, respectively, those will become 17 and 16. Uh, why 17 in dex? Well, we will pick up second chance and I will bump that up to 18, so that's perfect. Our fighter archetype is going to be the samurai, mainly because of his fighting spirit feature. Starting at third level, your intensity in battle can shield you and help you strike true. As a bonus action on your turn, you can give yourself advantage on weapon attack rolls until the end of the current turn. When you do so, you also gain 5 temporary hit points. The number of temporary hit points increases when you reach certain levels in this class, increasing to 10 at 10th level and 15 at 15th level. You can use this feature 3 times and you regain all expended uses of it when you finish a long rest. Uh, you're a fighter, you're going to have quite a few attacks as you level up. Action Surge will allow you to double this uh, once per short rest and Fighting Surge allows you to take a full turn with advantage on your attacks three times per long rest. So imagine being a level 11 fighter who has three attacks per turn, you pop your Action Surge to make that six and then you pop Fighting Spirits to have six attacks with advantage. If you roll any ones, you re-roll them because you're a halfling. If some of the rolls are still very, very bad, you can use the lucky feat to increase the numbers again. You're going to have some happy, happy, slashy times. At level 4, pick up either lucky or second chance. It's your choice if you want the extra dexterity sooner or later. And then at level 6, pick up the other one. At level 8, our goal is to pick up a bounty for luck. And that means that by level 8, we will have all of our luck features online ready to go and mess with everyone's dice starting at level 10 uh, you get a use of fighting spirit back at the start of combat if you don't have any left so that's nice to have as well and higher level samurai allow you to swap out advantage to add even more attacks which is nice to have as well i mean it's not more dice but it works out that leaves you with more than enough ability score increases to flavor your fighter the way you see fit. You can max out his scores, you can pick up some other feats, just enjoy. It is one of the great things about being a fighter, the characters are super super customizable. Now that I've covered all the luck based mumbo jumbo I had to offer you, we're going to talk about the RP aspect of these characters. What we want to avoid when playing a character like this is just to sit at the table and be like mm, Oh yeah, I uh, roll the one so I can re-roll that one and then oh no, it's still bad I'll ask my lucky feet and pow your orc is dead. We don't want that We want people to tell us how this luck is happening What is happening at the moment and how is this causing your character to f succeed where it should otherwise fail? There are many, many ways to visualize how luck works for your chosen halfling. I'll demonstrate by um, telling you three little concepts that I thought of. You can take those, use them as you see fit. They're here for inspiration. Just remember that um, weaving the luck into the general story is going to make it a more enjoyable experience, not just for you, but for the other players at the table, including the DM. Aya and her party are being ambushed by orcs. She engages two of them to protect her fellow party members. The first orc swings his axe at her and it seems like it's going to be a flawless hit. Aya is easily distracted though and she sees that because of the hasty nature of the ambush she forgot to tie her left boot. She bends over trying to tuck away the laces so that she wouldn't trip over them. That would be very bad luck indeed. She hardly notices the orc axe sweeping over her head and when she gets back up she prepares to attack the now slightly confused and out of balance orc. Theo always had a knack for seeing the future. He has seen other people's fates. 
Studying divination magic was a natural fit for him. Because of the studies, he has not learned only to predict the future with more accuracy, but his powers also allow him to bend fate to his will. When he's fighting, he regularly gets small visions, warning him of impending danger or actions that are doomed to fail. Thanks to this, he can try to interfere and provide his fellows with instructions on how to land that critical blow or how to dodge most of that lightning bolt. It makes their undertakings go more smoothly. He's not always successful, but his fate bending has turned around many fights and other situations. Maybe someday he can learn the legendary foresight spell and become a true master of fate. Bren has been lucky since birth and has never made a secret out of it. In fact, Bren knows so damn well things will turn out as they should that they regularly don't even undertake actions to avoid danger. They just rely on pure luck to make sure that their undertaking succeed. Arrows have whizzed by this halfling without them flinching, trusting their lucky stars that they will be fine. Sure, on occasion a few cuts and bruises are obtained, but all in all, Bren believes there is little reason to steer another course as long as luck is on their side. These were three very simple examples on how to RP a very lucky character. Dumb luck, fade bending, and pure arrogance. You don't have to be a wizard to do the whole fade bending thing. It could be that your halfling just possesses this kind of supernatural ability, regardless of what class they are. I just wanted to show you that you can do more than declare that you're going to do your seventh reroll of the session. As I said before, if you weave it into the story, you're going to improve everyone's player experience. That's it. That's all I have to show you for these lucky bastard builds. And just like how I didn't start with a bad Dirty Harry reference, I will not end with a bad Hunger Game reference. Don't hesitate to leave a comment. Tell me whether you like these builds or not, how you would play them, and maybe which alterations you would make to them. And kindly subscribe and then you will see whatever idea sprouts out of my head next time when we enter the Attic Dungeon.